Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us for the 2021 Women in Agriculture Conference webinars. On behalf of the Ulster Farmers Union and the Rural Affairs Committee, I would extend a warm welcome to you all, and I hope you have an enjoyable evening with us. I'd especially like to welcome Veronica Morris, Rural Support, Norma Rohan, Embrace Farm, Michelle Sherlow, Food NI, who are our guest speakers for this evening. And of course, Nicola Weir, BBC Farming Matters, our chair throughout the webinar series and a speaker on the final evening. Unfortunately, we can't greet you all in person and hold our conference in the normal way, but we felt it was important to continue to recognise and celebrate the work that our women do within the agricultural industry and hold a virtual series of webinars that you can enjoy from the comfort and safety of your own homes at this time. We have an excellent lineup of speakers for all three evenings who will share their knowledge, experience and understanding of our industry and the many challenges that it presents to us all, whether that be physical, mental, financial or administrative, we can be resilient and resourceful through difficult times. Just as we have shown and we're continuing to show throughout the COVID-19 pandemic and the onslaught of Brexit. This evening, we will see the launch of the Life Beyond Bereavement Programme, which was very much the initiative of our UFU president, Victor Chestnut, who has seen firsthand the real need for bereavement support and practical assistance for our farming families when they face devastating tragedy. Through the collaborative work of the charities, Rural Support and Embrace Farm, this much needed service has become a reality. Our sincere thanks must go to Veronica Morris and Norma Rowan for the tremendous work that they have put in to ensure that this valuable support service is now in place for our farming families. We look forward to what our inspirational speakers have to say and would thank them for taking time out to join us and share their knowledge, experience, and I've no doubt practical viewpoints when it comes to our question and answer sessions. At this point, I'd like to take a moment to thank the NFU Mutual for their generous sponsorship of the webinars, Food NI for the fantastic hampers for our free draw on the final evening, the Ulster Farmers Union and its office bearers for their continued support for our women in agriculture. The dedicated staff members behind the scene, Heather Stewart, events officer, Sarah Morell, our policy officer, the communications team, and of course, the Rural Affairs Committee, all of whom have been so committed to bringing this event together for you. Lastly, and by no means least, to all of you viewers who are joining us this evening, thank you again. And always remember that you are great ambassadors for women in agriculture and the Northern Ireland agri-food industry. Thank you. And I will now pass you over to the very capable hands of Nicola Weir. Thank you, Nicola. No, thank you, Jennifer, for your very kind and warm words. And good evening, everyone, to the Ulster Farmers Union 2021 Virtual Women in Agriculture Conference, part one. You're most welcome and we are delighted to have so many logged on to join us this evening. It is much appreciated uh, that you're giving up this time and we hope you take away from it some brilliant information from our wonderful speakers that will help you in your journey along that bumpy road of agriculture, particularly after that dreaded B word that has just been mentioned. First of all, I'd like to introduce myself. My name is Nicola Weir and I present Farming Matters on BBC Radio Ulster on a Tuesday evening. That's 6pm to 7pm and you can listen again on BBC Sounds. Share with this audience, you'll forgive me if I do a wee bit of advertising. I've been with the BBC almost 20 years, so I started when I was about 12 years old. And I've worked on such programmes as Good Morning Ulster, Evening Extra, Talk Back, BBC Newsline, Spotlight and the Stephen Nolan Show, both on TV and radio. Please forgive me. Now, Stephen likes to think he is the biggest show in the country. Well, he doesn't. Farming Matters is the biggest show in the country. And I managed to escape his clutches in 2019. And I present that show on BBC Radio Ulster, as I've said. And I produced Gardener's Corner 
on a Saturday morning, which goes hand in hand with the agriculture. Now, farming has been at the core of my being since I was born. My grandfather was a pig farmer in Maherlin. Has to be said Maherlin, he got very, very cross whenever people said Marilyn. And my other grandfather was a beef and dairy farmer in Anahilt, just outside Hillsborough. So I spent many a wonderful Saturday or Sunday or a school holiday trying to help them out with the milking or observing the piglets. But what it did teach me what from an early age, what was where my food came from and how hard farmers work to produce a quality produce by giving the best care and attention to their animals. And that is why I have to commend this evening, the Ulster Farmers Union for launching their Dig at Schools competition. What a fantastic way for primary school children to experience and find out about food, farming and the countryside. So please do check that out if you get a chance. Now I live just outside Ballymena and I managed to catch the hold of a sheep farmer's son called Peter. Now I must stress at this stage, he is not Peter Weir, the education minister. I am always asked that question, different Peter Weir. So we live on a farm and my father-in-law is now retired, but I have to say having the countryside and farm at our back door has not only been a wonderful treat for my children who are George and Imogen, and they're older than I care to admit, but also a blessing during this COVID lockdown when we were fortunate enough to have our family close by. So now that you find out a wee bit more about me, it's time to find out a wee bit more about the influential and engaging woman who will be talking to you tonight. Now, I just want to say it is inspiring and motivational to hear and see these women blazing a trail in agriculture, an industry that is still dominated by men, but I think we are most definitely getting our voices heard. Now, before I introduce our first speakers, a bit of housekeeping for you. First of all, this evening is being recorded and a link will be sent out post event to watch again if you wish. Questions should be through the Q&A button, not the chat button. So please remember that for later on. And I want you to ask as many questions as you want and I will direct as many as I can to the speakers. So this is your opportunity to get as much information as you can. There will be a survey at the end, so please complete so we can keep improving what we give to you year on year. And we expect the session to last no more than about an hour and a half. The charity we are supporting is Life Beyond, and there will be an opportunity to donate via the Just Giving, Just Giving link at the end of the seminar. Now, to your first two speakers for this evening, I want to welcome Veronica Morris. After spending 25 years working in various non-profit and charitable organisations across Northern Ireland, Veronica became Chief Executive of Rural Support in January 2020. Veronica is originally from, I'm probably going to pronounce this wrong, Veronica, so you can give off to me. Is it Killies Hill, a small rural community between Dungannon and Bally Galway? I can hear everybody shouting at me already. And her extended family have been farmers for several generations. She has substantial experience in support, supporting organisations and their teams through organisational change and has also spent the last decade as a mentor and coach for individuals experiencing physical and mental health challenges. She is passionate about helping farmers and rural families to build mental resilience through practical support and coaching. And in her spare time, I don't know where she gets spare time from, enjoys photography and writing about matters relating to health and well-being. And it's also a very warm welcome to Norma Rowan. Now, Norma says she's a stay-at-home mother to three children. That sounds like an enormous feat and a challenge in itself. And she's originally from West Limerick and now settled in Leash, married to dairy farmer Brian Rowan. She is co-founder and chairperson of Embrace Farm. Now, the reason why Norma set up this organisation, I'll leave her to explain to you, but it was birthed from grief within her own family. The very first National Remembrance Service was held in 2014 and Embrace Farm is now officially registered as a charity to support those affected by farm accidents. So ladies, it's an honour to introduce you to the conference and it's over to you. Thank you Nicola and thank you Jennifer for both your warm welcomes and um, I will have to correct you Nicola on the pronunciation of my my hometown land is Kalisho. There probably were quite a number of people screaming at the screen uh, at the, your pronunciation, but you did, it was quite a good attempt. Thank you. Um, my name is Veronica Morris, as Nicola has said, I am Chief Executive of Rural Support. Um, I really would like to thank the union uh, for inviting me along today on behalf of the organization 
Um, we are so pleased to have had the opportunity to talk about this really important area of uh, resilience and resourcefulness and to talk about the Life Beyond programme, which is a new uh, programme we've set up uh, in partnership with Embrace Farm. Um, it has been such a challenging time for so many of our farming families and uh, many of whom have come through our virtual doors. Um, but uh, these families have proven time and time again that they are tougher than life is hard. And it is our honor to work alongside them and to help them move to a better place uh, in their futures as they go through whatever crisis or challenge they might have. Uh, rural support has come through a challenging year as well, but we have been well supported by our funders, uh, by our corporate sponsors and by our donors, many of whom I'm sure are um, listening here tonight. So I would like to take this opportunity to say thank you, particularly to uh, Ulster Farmers Union and NFU Mutual Charitable Trust. So without both of you, we really would not be able to help our farming families. Um, so we're very, very grateful. What I want to do now is share a, a short presentation um, and tell you a little bit more about our organization and tell you a wee bit more about our Life Beyond program. So hopefully technology will be kind and uh, this will work. So just give me a second, bring it up. Okay, so hopefully everyone uh, can see the screen. So rural support uh, as an organization has been in place for almost 20 years. Um, it was set up back at the time of the foot and mouth, but it has evolved into a very different organization over the years. Our vision is of a vibrant and resilient farming community in Northern Ireland. And we do that through providing professional and practical support, to farmers, farm and families and farm businesses throughout the region. We know very well how important it is to listen and to understand. We know how important it is to value every individual within the farm and family and beyond. We try to bring hope and positivity to the situations that people find themselves in. And our overall mission uh, is to empower people to make the changes they need to make in order to bring themselves and their families forward. We're a charity that is based in uh, Lockery campus here in Cookstown. Um, we do provide services right across Northern Ireland. Uh, we are, uh, we have 10 in our team at the minute and in our staff team, all of whom are women. We are currently recruiting, so we may end up with a few men, but we are a small team, but we are certainly mighty. We work with a number of farm and farm family uh, mentors um, who provide expertise in financial technical business uh, and counselling support. And we couldn't uh, operate without the support of our volunteer team. And we have about 35 uh, on our books at the minute. And they provide support right across the organisation, including uh, on our helpline. So the type of support that we uh, provide, we have our helpline, uh, which is open 9 to 9, Monday to Friday. And it provides listening support and signposting where needed, but it also brings people into our mentoring program. Our mentoring program will provide support, as I said before, business, financial, and technical. And one to one mentoring, we go out to the farm, uh, we sit around the kitchen table, we help families to work out their options depending on whatever crisis or challenge that they're facing. We also provide counseling, uh, mentoring support as well for emotional and physical health issues that people may be facing. We have our social farming support service, uh, which provides uh, promotion and coordination for social farming right across Northern Ireland. Um, we have a number of outreach support and referral uh, processes in place so that if we can't help, we certainly know uh, someone who can. Um, we provide that em uh, emotional and practical support. And overall, through it all, we provide and promote positive mental health and wellbeing. I thought it might be useful to touch on the topic of tonight's um, uh, conference, uh, which is resilience and resourcefulness. I mean, there's so many definitions of what this means, and it does mean uh, different things to different people. One thing is for sure uh, within rural support, and we see resilience and resourcefulness in action every day with the farming families that we work with. 
um, whether they're through to our uh, crisis support services or whether they work with us on our non-crisis uh, program. Um, resilience is the quality that allows people to be knocked down by adversities in life and come back at least as strong as before. And coming from farming backgrounds and from rural communities, we know people who are like this. We hope we are people like this um, because life certainly can be tough out there. But it's how you come back and how you bounce back from that is what will build that resilience. Resourcefulness is all around getting uh, things done where there are obstacles and constraints. And we all know, um, I certainly from my own family background, um, that women are particularly resourceful uh, when sometimes there isn't a lot of things around to be resourceful with. Um, the two together are developed through experience, through life experience. And it doesn't have to be a long life experience, any kind of life experience from young to old, you can develop resilience and resourceful, resourcefulness through that experience. They both develop through being brave, through having the courage to face what is, as opposed to what we would like it to be, what it used to be, um, or what we wished it was. We are courageous enough to face what is in front of us. And we also can develop resilience and resourcefulness through expecting the best, but being prepared for the worst. And this is something within rural support uh, through our programs that we try and encourage as much as possible is to plan ahead, to look at what might go wrong and try and have something in place, a plan in place in order to deal with it. Because you can predict some crises and challenges that can come up and some of them you can't. The stronger you feel and the more plans you have in place, the more likely you are to be able to deal with them when they do appear. So how rural support um, helps people to develop uh, that resilience and resourcefulness and helps the farm business uh, to get to where it needs to go to support the farm and family. Uh, our farm support program is headed up by Gillian Reid. Uh, I'm sure many of you may uh, know Gillian. Um, we and it's divided into two sections. We have our crisis support services, which is where people are facing a challenge or an immediate crisis. And it could be for any number of reasons. It could be um, financial challenges, uh, issues or debt. Um, it could be an issue where there's been a bereavement in the family. It could be an issue where someone's had a diagnosis um, and they have to make, put arrangements in place to deal with that. It could be matters relating to succession uh, and future planning. So within that uh, service, within that section, we have our support line. We have mentoring support available, whether that's business, financial, or technical. We have our counselling support, whether that is emotional or trauma counselling. We have our emergency fund, where we have small pots of money that we can help where people are really, uh, you know, in dire difficulties through no fault of their own. And we have our Life Beyond program, which we will talk about a little bit further on. Uh, in the non-crisis uh, support side, we have our more proactive programs. So this includes our farm family progression planning um, and one-to-one -one mentoring. So this is where people will look at different elements relating to their farm business and also their farm and family and develop plans uh, for each area. Um, that could be financial and technical cash flow matters. It could be relating to crisis uh, succession or future planning. And Again, something so important is to look at succession and future planning, not only for the farmer um, or the head of holdings, uh, but also for um, whoever else in the family uh, who has a lead in the farming family. So we talk a lot sometimes about um, where there's been a death in, in a farm and you think of the ma it only being the man who dies, but often the woman dies and leaves a massive hole, not only emotionally for the farmer and for any children that are left behind, but also for the farming business as well. So it's really important as women that we take that on and we build that into any planning that's happening and that we insist that we are around the table when these things are being discussed. We also provide programs that are relating to uh, mental and physical health and wellbeing. And um, some of our uh, examples of our programs are business of farming, which has been supported by NFU Mutual Charitable Trust and will be rolled out now in the autumn time. Our Coping with the Pressures of Farming program, which is our mental health awareness and support uh, projects delivered through um, Farm Family Key Skills. Our Princess Countryside Fund Resilience program this year focusing on uh, younger farmers. And when I say younger, I mean over the age of 30. Um, 
We have our befriending scheme across the hedgerow, which works with older and vulnerable uh, members of the farming community, uh, which is in partnership with young farmers uh, of the Ulster. And then we have our Ply Home programme, which is for older and isolated uh, farmers, which we uh, recently secured funding for through National Lottery, and that will be rolled out now over the summer months. Another programme we have is our Mental Health Mentor Training Programme with Young Farmers uh, Clubs of Ulster, which is helping to teach the next generation how to look after their mental health and also how to support each other through peer-to-peer -peer support. And we also have our online uh, resources um, farm support hub, which is uh, about to be launched, excitingly for us, because it's taken a wee bit of time to get it there. But tonight we're here to talk mainly about the Life Beyond programme. This programme came together uh, as a result of uh, the input from key people here in Northern Ireland and also in the South of Ireland. Uh, in particular, um, Victor Chestnut has really championed this, um, the need for um, bereavement services here in Northern Ireland. Uh, as an organisation, Rural Support saw um, that there was definitely an increase in demand from the COVID period of restrictions um, took place uh, back just over a year ago now. And it became clear over time that there wasn't the type of services available in Northern Ireland that were needed to help people face the unfaceable. Um, our sincere thanks are extended to Victor and also to Jennifer Hawkes and to Ruth Irvine from the Rural Affairs Committee who also really pushed for this. And we are very grateful. Um, conversations were had with Victor and with Norma in Embrace Farm because there was nothing like what Embrace Farm do in the south here in, in the north. So together we, we have come up with the Life Beyond program and we're very excited to be able to, to launch it today and there'll be more information provided also at the Balmoral Show, hopefully uh, all being well that it goes ahead. So the goal is to provide a range of bereavement support services and activities for the farming family in Northern Ireland with the aim of improving the mental, social and physical well-being of farming families who have bereaved, have been bereaved. Um, this will include those bereaved through farm accident, through suicide, through, through sudden or expected death. Uh, and it would also provide support for those affected by a farm accident, whether that is directly or indirectly. The support will be provided over the initial 12 month period and then beyond if needed. Um, that 12 month period may not be linear, but it will be at point of need and it will be provided free of charge. So the type of uh, support that we will be providing will be tailored to what the family might need. OK, so it, it will, as we expect it to fall into two phases. So phase one will be that one to one element. And typically that would happen early on after a bereavement has um, has happened, whether it's, you know, a farm accident or whether it's it's a death through a, another means. Um, we will provide support through um, our support line initially. We will then link up a particular expertise to go out on farm to work with whoever has been left behind. So that will work on the farm itself, the farm business has been left behind, looking at cash flow looking at practical matters in terms of, you know, making sure that the farm business is able to keep going, simple things like, you know, the cows still need milk and how is that going to happen? And seeing if there are plans that have been put in place. And if there have, great, making sure those plans are followed. Um, but if there hasn't, then working out what options those that are left behind uh, have in relation to the farming business. We will also provide alongside that then uh, counselling support. We have recruited a number of mentors who have counselling and psychotherapy backgrounds, including um, some who have trauma, uh, who are trauma specialists. So this is particularly important for anyone who has, um, there, whether it's been a farm accident or an accident within a farming family, um, and also sometimes where there has been a sudden death that has just that has just happened, and that can bring with it um, different levels of trauma, and <clears throat> having that expertise on our books and able to be called in at short notice is something that we identified very early on in the last year as there was a significant gap uh, in those services available here in Northern Ireland. So we put that into this programme and we're very pleased to see that that is already helping farming families that are coming through our doors um, at the moment. It will also provide one-to-one -one, uh, bereavement support. This will be emotional support where you have that 
a befriender, someone will, who will come have the cup of tea, contact, connect in with you um, as a farm and family on a, a regular basis um, once the first two areas have been covered. Um, I should say we will also and are also already providing support to children of, um, of uh, people who have passed away. Um, and in lots of those cases, we are seeing uh, significant trauma, particularly where there's been a farm accident. Um, so working with quite young children and having that expertise there um, to, to support them is really is invaluable within a family. So once a family has been through um, this first phase, we expect they would be ready to move on to more peer-to-peer -peer group support. So these groups will be designed and created um, in partnership with the families themselves um, and they typically would fall into it could be women men siblings uh, family members farm accident survivors so we're going to let Norma talk a wee bit more about that because that's their area that they do so well um, and so compassionately in the south of Ireland and we're, we're just really looking forward to seeing how that is rolled out up here in Northern Ireland we will also provide a number of events and seminars and we will have online resources through a dedicated farm support hub where people can come and at their leisure, you know, read up on what they could be doing, particularly if they've got young children, how do they support their young children through this period um, of, of uh, bereavement. As I said earlier, all support will be provided free of charge and it will be provided at point of need. So it is where families need the support. Um, it doesn't matter who they are, how much they earn, how big their farm is, how small their farm is. If they are a farming family and they need support, they will receive that through the Life Beyond program. So the steering group has a number um, of people on it. Uh, Victor Chestnut has very kindly agreed to um, be on our steering group and has been such a great support to both myself and Norma and the rest of, of our team here in getting this thing up and going. ABP Food Group, uh, George Mullen and Liam McCarthy, ABP have um, provided some uh, funding to help the organization help the programme get going in its first year. Um, myself and Gillian are on representing rural support. Olivia Monaghan is a counsellor and play therapist, one of our mentors who works uh, with our farming families. Uh, from Embrace Farm, we have Norma Rowan and Catherine Collins who work very closely together with ourselves to ensure that this programme is rolled out to meet the needs uh, as they evolve for these families. Reverend John Stanbridge, um, who is from uh, up to the north of the country, uh, who has um, provided great support in terms of pastoral care and just a, a, a levelness to, to bring to the table and to represent those families that are out there that are facing some really significant uh, challenges on the ground. And then we will ha also have a family representative that we haven't uh, put someone in place just yet until we can get things right up and going uh, again. But as you can see, a good group of people, um, very, very committed to uh, developing this programme and ensuring that it runs on for a number of years and grows and develops in the way that our farming uh, families deserve. The Life Beyond will uh, has a number of, of aims really. It, it will develop a community of people who care, who can relate to this area um, and can be compassionate and empathetic. Um, it will provide uh, people who will look at the whole picture not just part of the picture, um, helping with the farming business, uh, issues around financial matters, cash flow, and the emotional well-being. And at no point are we saying that this thing will work uh, on a linear basis. Some people don't get over the shock for six months and may never want to see a counsellor until they're at that point. They might never want to see a counsellor at all. But whatever we can do to bring their stress levels down in managing some of the practical issues, then it allows them to help hopefully move through the process of grief um, in a way that, that is as least traumatic as possible. Uh, we will also ensure that we recognise people are individual um, and that the care that we provide is, um, is related to the whole person and their individual needs. So we're not there to say this is the way you should feel, this is the way it should be. We're there to listen to how it actually is and to help people to move through that. Um, walking with that family through that first year of loss when things are at their most acute. 
We also aim to help the individuals involved to take small steps forward to get themselves to a place where they are whole again, if they can even imagine that that can ever happen. Um, but time does move on and the resilience grows. Um, and the other important part of the Life Beyond program is celebrating the contributions that have been made by our loved ones who have passed away, both to the land and to our lives and that of our the generations that are to come. And uh, Norma's going to talk a little bit more about uh, what that will encompass for uh, this program. So um, I'd just like to say thank you. I uh, am absolutely delighted that UFU and Victor have chosen the Life Beyond program um, as its fundraising project for this year, um, for his presidency actually. And uh, we are very, very grateful for that support. So I'm gonna just knock off the share here and hopefully, there we go. I'm going to hand over to Norma and thank you. Good evening, everyone. Um, thank you for that, Veronica. Um, a great description of the Life Beyond, Beyond programme, something I'm very excited to get stuck into. Um, I said, good evening, everyone. Um, I'm delighted to be here tonight, um, having the opportunity to be among um, what I guess is probably majority of women watching tonight, um, the heart of our farm families, most definitely. I would like to say a very kind and sincere thank you to the Ulster Farmers Union for having me here tonight. I'm delighted to be invited. As tonight's team is about resilience, I am going to tell you about how and why Embrace Farm came to be. And that involves me telling you my story. Um, I'm originally from West Limerick in the southwest of Ireland. I come from a farm family. Um, there's about nine of us. I grew up in a very small three bedroom house with my siblings, my parents and my dad's uh, brother and sister. Um, so hence to this day, I am a very sound sleeper, something my husband finds hard to understand when the kids are up in the middle of the night. Um, 11 years ago, I met Brian, a uh, dairy farmer. Uh, he, de, he farms pedigree Halsteins here on the farm. And within two years, uh, I found myself married. You know, as farms don't move, I now find myself living in lovely Leash. It's about two hours from my own home place. So as newlyweds, we were in our own little happy bubble. We were renovating the old farmhouse. And I found myself pregnant very, very quickly with our first child. Uh, so everything happened quite quickly. Uh, but, you know, we were happy on our journey. So we were and um, welcoming the start of our little family. Um, Julie was born, first of our three children. Um, I don't think life could have gotten any better at that stage. We were navigating our way through life, albeit um, trying to find our way with a newborn. Had its challenges, but all was good. All was good. I arrived home from hospital on a Sunday. It just happened to be Brian's birthday as well, and it also happened to be Father's Day. So I think uh, excitement levels were, were beside himself. Two days later, our perfect happy little bubble was shattered into smithereens. Brian's dad was involved in an accident here on our farm. He was rushed to hospital and placed on life support. And those machines were switched off three days later. And there began our journey into trauma and grief. And I remember the day that Liam went to the hospital um, and Brian got the, the devastating news um, that there was nothing that could be done. At the same time that he was trying to contact his two sisters who live at the other side of the country to come to be with their dad, he was also ringing a neighbour to come and milk our cows. Um, being from farm families, you know, human and animal, they're, they're both treated with the same importance. As I was new to the area um, and I was just home for, after having a baby, I was on my own in the home. And suddenly the house became overcome with people. 
many of these were strangers to me. They were Brian's neighbours and his friends and his family, um, but they were strangers to me because I was new to the area. Um, I guess in the space of that week, the shock that set in in all of us had a huge effect on me myself. I had started to breastfeed our, our child and the shock of what had happened meant I didn't have a supply to keep going with that, which is something that had quite a psychological effect on me as we had more children. I guess to have no control over this journey was something that I personally found very difficult because my life was now controlled and guided by my husband's grief. And it was something I very much resented at the time. I wanted life to go back to the way it was. My heart and my head were in turmoil. My head knowing that things couldn't go back to the way they were, but my heart wanting it so badly. My husband, he wanted to be strong. He wanted to be the fixer in the family. He wanted to take on his father's role, but he was hurting. And he blamed himself for what had happened because he wasn't with his dad at the time the accident happened. He was inside with me because our public health nurse had come to visit, you know, the way they pay that first visit. Something that affected him as we had other children as well. We coasted along, we kept our heads above water, just about emotionally, um, trying to deal with something neither of us had ever been through before. It truly was a test in the very early days of our marriage. Our neighbours and extended family were the best to help as they are in all farming communities. They just rally around. They milked our cows. They did bits around the farm. But, you know, eventually they had to go back to their own lives and their own farms. So about 18 months later, um, we started to look for outside support specific to farming, but there wasn't any to be found. So after many a conversation, we decided to set up our own charity, Embrace Farm. Embrace Farm is a support network to those affected by farm accidents. And Embrace Farm supports both the bereaved family and the survivor of a farm accident. We have always wanted to operate in Northern Ireland as Brian's dad, Liam, was a champion ploughman and he spent many, uh, he judged many a ploughing competition in Northern Ireland. They came to his funeral, some of the ploughmen uh, for a guard of honour from Northern Ireland. The health and safety executive um, will tell you all about the statistics about how many people die each year on our farms. And they'll give you a breakdown of what those different causes were around machinery and all sorts. Embrace Farm talks about the people behind those statistics. We put a press into each one of those numbers and we speak about the true toll of devastation that is caused. Now, I'd like to tell you about some of the people that we encounter in Embrace Farm. Women, mainly women in all stages of their lives. We did and left behind to pick up the pieces, both emotionally and practically. And I guess after the emotional toll trying to deal with that, before they can even get to dealing with that, they have all the practical things to deal with, legal stuff, financial stuff. Um, it's only when something goes wrong that you realize how important these things are, how important it is to have a will in place, how important it is to have insurance on heavy borrowings, when those things are not there, it leads to further complications and further difficulties. Many women are very concerned about obviously their children's grief and how their children are coping. Succession, what does a young widow do? Does she keep the farm? Does she lease it? Does she sell it? Has she had the conversation with her husband beforehand to know what his wishes would have been? And as she starts to make decisions on what to do with the family farm, she may be surrounded by her husband's family. They may be living next to her. They may not. They may have many an opinion on what should be done with, with the farm that was originally theirs. And because of the decisions that she makes in the best interest of her family, 
um, may lead to further conflict and further family breakdown in relationships. We come across parents who have lost their child in traumatic circumstances. Not always, but usually it is the dad that is operating the machinery where the child has died. And I don't think anybody can understand the sense of guilt and the sense of responsibility that comes with that. Nobody can understand that, only somebody who has been through it before. We come across adults who mourn the death of their father, the loss of their mentor, the person they work with each day. We see adult children trying to take on their father's role within the family. Sometimes it's welcome, sometimes it's not. Even if it's welcome, it can add, it can bring an added pressure. Men, and sometimes women too, who have to adapt to living each day with a life altering disability following uh, an accident. Survivors of farm accidents have a huge journey to go through as well. Have to have the strength to battle through a health system where they need to find their voice. Many uh, survivors who have prosthetics tell us about trying to find their voice to tell about a prosthetic limb not fitting them properly and how they are sometimes listened to and how they're sometimes not. These battles can lead to some addiction issues, substance abuse issues, depression, suicide ideation. And I guess as farmers, we're, we're very much in the mind of carrying the land from one generation to the next. And this is something farm accident survivors struggle a lot with. They've received a farm from the generation before them. And if they don't find themselves in a physical ability to be able to manage that farm, to be able to carry it on to the next generation, that plays a huge toll on them. Embrace Farm supports all of these people who unexpectedly find themselves on a journey of loss and of trauma. To help the well-being of our farm families, Embrace Farm has built a community of support in response to these people's needs. Embrace Farm creates a space for people to connect and to share their story with people who truly understand the devastating impact a farm tragedy has. And we like to do that over a cup of tea. You're welcome to have a look on our website to see some more information about our supports and our services. I'd like to finish up tonight uh, by telling you about what Embrace Farm brings to the partnership with Rural Support and the new Life Beyond programme that Veronica mentioned, which is being launched at the minute. Life Beyond will look after all types of bereavement in Northern Ireland, and that's something I'm very glad about. It's something we want to do down here as well. A celebration event will be hosted this coming October to remember all the great farmers gone before us. It will be a time to gather, to remember and to reflect as these farmers, they were our greatest teachers. I'm very much looking forward to being able to meet as many farm families as possible to our partnership with Rural Support and with the guiding help of the union and many other agribusinesses in Northern Ireland. Now, thank you for allowing me to tell my story and please do be safe in all that you do. Veronica and Norma, thank you so much for speaking to us this evening. And Norma, thank you so much for sharing that story. Um, I, I can tell that it was difficult for you to do that. And I'm sure that many of you who were listening will have found that very emotional and can maybe relate uh, to what was being said there. So um, Norma, just thank you so much for giving that very personal glimpse into your life. It is so much appreciated. Um, I know that there are uh, quite a few of you watching um, this evening. Thank you very much for tuning in. Um, we also want to say that you can ask questions of our speakers tonight. 
you can ask whatever you want to Veronica and Norma. So please do get your questions coming in. You can do that via the Q&A button below. So please do that in the button below. Now we do have another speaker for you this evening and that is um, our very experienced speaker and it is the wonderful Michelle Sherlow. And I've told you this before, Michelle, I do love reading your column in Farm Week. Um, always very insightful and I always enjoy reading it. Of course, everybody, there are other farm newspapers available, so please do buy them too. Michelle is the founder and chief executive of Food NI, whose mission is to enhance the reputation of food and drink from Northern Ireland. Following delivery of the first ever year of food and drink in 2016, Michelle is working to establish Northern Ireland as a leading food region in the UK by 2021. Food NI is a membership organization which represents over 450 member companies, and that's including 200 Taste of Ulster restaurants. Michelle is also a board member of Tourism NI and a member of the Food, Farming and Countryside Commission. So good evening, Michelle, and we're delighted to have you joining us this evening, and we really look forward to what you're going to be telling us. So it's over to you. Thank you very much. Um, it's great to be here. And um, that was those were some very powerful stories we just heard. Um, so my presentation is a wee bit about looking to the future. Um, like many people during the pandemic, normal business has stopped to an extent, but we've had a chance to kind of think, uh, do some research, watch loads and loads of videos on the future of food and farming. So I just want to share a wee bit of the story about Food NI and um, what I think are going to be influences and trends in food and farming over the next 10 years. So I have a presentation here um, and I'm just going to share my screen. And Okay, so yeah, uh, I'm Michelle. Um, I actually started life not in food, but as an accountant. And one of the jobs I had was with Invest NI. And part of that role was traveling a lot around the world. Um, one thing that always struck me whenever I visited other countries was the pride and the passion that other people had in their food and drink. And that's really what inspired me to start uh, Food NI. One of the key founders at that time was uh, the Ulster Farmers Union. And uh, I worked very closely at that time with Clark Black and um, other people to set up Food NI. Our objective is to enhance Northern Ireland's reputation in food and drink. And way back then, Northern Ireland was, the food and drink landscape in Northern Ireland was very, very different. I think the best you could have said about Northern Irish food and drink in 2008 was that it was undiscovered and it was unknown. Um, I remember starting off uh, and so many people told us that we were mad um, that I think the expression that was frequently used was on a hiding to nothing. Um, but one of the first things we did actually was start a food, start the food pavilion, the local food pavilion at Balmoral Show. And it seems amazing when you look back, the first year we only had six local companies. And now you'll know we have upwards of 100 companies in the food pavilion. Um, every year and we're hoping to be back, all being well, we'll be back in September. But it was almost like all of the um, interest and in food and drink in Northern Ireland had really been, I suppose, a bit suppressed by our political situation. And we noticed that um, we started to get lots of, of new businesses coming along. So I remember one of the first was Glasty Farm ice cream. Um, and it was one of the first um, artisan ice cream producers in Northern Ireland. 
Then people started to make ciders, beers, hand-rolled butters, fresh stock, all sorts of things. And in fact, if you go around the food pavilion now, you'll probably not realise it, but about half of the companies that exhibit there now will only have started up in the last 10 years. Strangely enough, just on the theme of what we're talking about, just shortly after um, I left Invest and I to start Food and I, I actually lost my mother. Um, it was just in January after we started in November and um, she passed away very suddenly, totally unexpectedly, um, at a relatively young age, um, in her mid sixties. Um, and I was faced with a very difficult decision to make it would have been easy for me to return to my job in the public sector, um, but I really felt that in Food and I, I'd find a passion, and it, it was something that really was very, very important to me. So I, I don't know how I did it at the time, but I got the strength to go on. Um, we started to lobby in 2012 for a year of food and drink, and in 2016, we had our first ever year of food and drink, which was a great success. The key measure was it actually increased visitors' attitudes to Northern Irish food and drink really significantly. So I suppose at one stage, people would come to Northern Ireland, not realizing that we always had wonderful food and drink, but after 2016, the message got out and people started to come here for the food. In 2019, we worked with um, on an all-island basis to have a Taste the Island Month. But unfortunately, we had to um, stop that because of COVID. But um, at the end of 2018, we went over to London. We'd entered uh, the Best Food Destination Award uh, for, um, I suppose it was all of the world. <laughs> A lot of companies from a lot of countries represented were European. Um, and I remember going in thinking we didn't have a chance to win, but actually Northern Ireland came first. And we walked away very proud of all the things that had happened to get our food and drink recognized out there and on the map. And I just thought I'd put up a slide of some of the ladies that have featured recently uh, in press for winning awards for successes. Um, you might recognize some of them. Um, Alison Abernethy of Abernethy Butter, and they've just won a major award. Um, Helen Mulholland from Bush Mills at the top. She is uh, a Bush Mills master distiller. And Catherine McKeever from Long Meadow Cider. Uh, just to let you know how things have moved on, Long Meadow is now actually sold on Amazon. Um, just, just a very interesting fact about the success of some of the businesses here. But of course, we were in full flight uh, when the pandemic struck, and um, I had to think about how did people get through the pandemic, and I think I've sort of categorized it into a number of things. First of all, the first thing I noticed and particularly about agri-food was great collaboration. Um, this couple um, on the bottom uh, left here, they started up a home delivery service for food. Marsh Direct did a dine-in to dine-out. We noticed a lot of people started up uh, farm shops um, one interesting thing about Northern Ireland is we don't actually have as many farm shops as other parts of the UK, um, but it's been great to see some of them set up during the pandemic. And we noticed great collaboration as well between restaurants and producers, and a lot of chefs give a lot of their time free uh, to cook um, in the early stages of the pandemic for food banks and for people who really had terrible food insecurity. I think the other thing that we saw was pivoting, which is really about innovation. Um, up to 50% of our taste of Ulster 
members opened up for takeaway for home delivery to provide meal solutions. As I've said, new farm shops sprung up. We saw this thing emerge. We hadn't realized uh, it existed, but we call them grocer ants. And those are the restaurants that actually became part grocers um, and put local food uh, stores onto the side of their restaurant. Some fantastic new delivery businesses were set up. Um, a brilliant one from Streamville Farm is called Moo to You, and it's massively expanded over the time of the pandemic. And also we saw people starting to deliver ready meals and to go into well-produced, good quality ready meals with an emphasis on health. Um, and I'll come back to that later on in my presentation. Sometimes I think the less said about Brexit, um, the better, but we're, we are where we are. Um, I mean, I think everybody realizes it's a very complex process and it's cost a lot of money to a lot of companies. The one concern that I have is that in England, they don't realize because they can't supply us that we can still supply them. So there's a lot of work um, that needs to be done to raise awareness of the fact that Northern Ireland is still a very important food producing region, twice as dependent on agriculture as any other region in the UK. And for us, uh, GB is a key market. I said that I'd looked at loads of um, videos and think tanks and a number of trends are coming out. First one really is localism and a growing love for local food. Now it was already on most people's agenda, but undoubtedly the pandemic has sped the change. Even the United Nations have come out and said that supply chains need to be short and fair and local. Another thing that has grown in recent years is food and drink tourism, and I believe it will grow more um, after uh, that we get back from this pandemic. Because what we've got is what everybody wants. We've got great natural spaces all around us. We're still connected to farms. We have nature. I think Northern Ireland has it in spades for the future. And I'm quite confident that coming out of the pandemic, that there will be a lot of success with a lot of agri-food businesses and a lot of people diversifying in agriculture to make the best of those assets. But it isn't just about localism. And I thought this was a very funny cartoon. I'm just going to share it with you. Um, it just is uh, sort of emphasizing the fact that at the minute, we've all been focusing on the uh, pressures of COVID and we've been worried about a recession and people are concerned about climate change, but also, and you'll know this very well as farmers, there's a massive concern about biodiversity collapse. The other thing coming through is sustainability and research is showing that people aren't just thinking about local they're also, also thinking about sustainable. And since the pandemic, they have been more focused on health. So what will be the legacy for agri-food? One of the things that we've seen happening is cooking, not commuting. And there's been a return to good traditional cooking methods at home. There was a recent European food behaviors report. Um, so I'm quoting some of this research from that, just in case you think I've created it. This was a survey of 9,000 um, consumers. People are saying that enjoying food and drink, having a wide variety, cooking skills and more time to cook will be important. Also important is going to be accessibility to food stores, and access to food at affordable prices. Unfortunately, one of the things coming out of the pandemic is that a lot of people 
have already or will lose their jobs. So we're going into a period of time where there will be people who have got money and time to cook and there's going to be people who are actually going to be concerned about how they put food on the table. I don't have the statistics for Northern Ireland, but I do know that in England, there's something like 14 million people who live daily with food insecurity. And that includes 5 million children. It just seems crazy in this day and age. As I said before, nutrition, healthy foods, and using good food to control your weight will also matter more. People are talking about their COVID kilos. And the other thing coming through very strongly is, as well as buying more local food, people want to reduce unsustainable packaging and food waste. Uh, and that's, that's good to see. It's, um, it's a trend that has been accelerated by the pandemic. So I thought about um, what other predictions have I have I noticed? Um, I've said already, more people are caring about the state of the planet. There's a real rise in what's known as conscious consumerism. People are saying that the regenerative economy will be the future. And people are talking about wealth being W-E-L-L-T-H, not W-E-A-L-T-H. And I think people are also realizing that um, a strong economy doesn't always have to be growing at a rapid pace. A strong economy can be thriving, but it needs to be fair and it needs to be balanced and there needs to be something in it for everybody. That may sound a bit like motherhood and apple pie, but it's definitely a trend that's coming through. I mentioned food tourism, and there's also prediction that there's going to be a change in tourism and that people won't want to go away necessarily to a hot climate and lie on a beach. What they want to do is experience a local community. So they'll we're, we're thinking that people will want to come to Northern Ireland. I think there's scope for them to stay on farm where that's appropriate and safe to do so. And all of these factors, food and drink is central to them all. It's central to our health. It's central to the state of climate change on the planet and this concept of regenerative economy. So I was just thinking about resourcefulness um, here are some examples. Um, I've tried to put as many successful ladies as possible in this presentation, but pivoting, um, here's a great example uh, with Rhonda, who started her gourmet grub club in Tyrone, where they delivered handmade meals to your door. We saw some partnering going on. I don't know if anybody noticed that Henderson's and Sainsbury's partnered. Um, at the time when Sainsbury's had empty shelves, um, Henderson's helped, helped them out and linked their supply chain, um, which I thought, was a, I thought was a great initiative um, and, and also shows you the strength of our food and drink industry in Northern Ireland, that someone like Henderson's can partner with a multinational like Sainsbury's. And the other thing, as I mentioned, uh, was new routes to market. And it's great to see Emily McGowan. I think she's a sixth or seventh generation vegetable farmer and her dad's Adrian. And they've opened Millbank Farm Shop in Sandfield. Um, and they grow vegetables for the, the shop from their own farm. Um, resilience was the other thing that we talked about. And I think resilience has become even more important since the pandemic started. Certainly, I think you need resilience at every stage in your life. But I think since the pandemic appeared, I think people have realized how important it is to have self-care, to think about your health and diet. Um, 
to really do something that you have a passion for. And I have been so fortunate with Food NI to have discovered that my passion in life was really to raise awareness about food and drink in Northern Ireland. So therefore, although it, it is work, it hasn't felt like work. And it's something that I'm happy to get up every morning um, in life and to deal with. I think the pandemic has taught us that it's really, really important to stay connected. And um, I know one of the things I've really missed over this last year has been uh, meeting people at things like Balmoral Show and meeting friends. I think my last tip is going to be try something new. And I'm just going to share with you a personal experience that I had last year. Um, unfortunately, my father was in a nursing home and caught COVID. And unfortunately, he didn't um, recover. Um, just to say the worst thing and the hardest thing about that was not being able to be with him, not being able to go to hospital to stay with him when he was ill and not being able to say goodbye. But a very good group of lady friends encouraged me to try something that I hadn't done before. And I cannot recommend it highly enough. And please don't laugh. Um, it was outdoor swimming. So a group of us went down to the beach. I remember standing there looking at the water thinking, I really don't want to do this. <laughs> But I've come so far, I have to get in now. <laughs> um, and at that time, it was just at the time my dad had passed. And, um, you know, I went into the water and I came out and I thought, if I can do that, I can hopefully do anything. And um, in many ways, I think it's important, no matter what age you are, to have a go, try something new. Uh, do it safely of course my husband did buy me a float and he did buy me boots and gloves to keep my hands and feet warm but um it's been an absolute lifesaver over the last 12 months so i hope you find some of that interesting and very happy to take any questions in the chat thank you Thank you for that, Michelle. I can say that whenever you were talking about the farm staycations, that sounds brilliant, particularly whenever you throw in the fact that you mentioned about food and drink from around the area. I mean, who needs Marbella? You can just stay at home. Um, also, Michelle, I think we can all relate this evening to the COVID kilos. I wouldn't even dare divulge how many COVID, COVID kilos I put on. And also, whenever you were talking about that wonderful cider and whiskey uh, that we have here, that's very dangerous at this time of the day, Michelle. Uh, everybody will be maybe looking for a wee dram after this. Um, as for the outdoor swimming, Michelle, uh, good for you, girl. I'm glad that you tried that. I tried that too in Newcastle. And I tell you, it wasn't for me and I'll never be back again. But sure, I tried it. It's not for me, but I definitely agree with you. You should try something new. Now, we've heard from all three of our speakers and lots of you have been asking questions. So I want to throw open the floor to our three speakers. Uh, so maybe if they want to unmute themselves and come back online uh, so we can throw them some questions of, um, that have been asked here. Um, Veronica, first of all to you, um, if someone has concerns regarding a family member who may appear to need support, how does one refer them to the Rural Support Programme? I suppose this might seem to be um, a secretive thing that they want to do. Is that possible? So what we would encourage uh, concerned family members or even concerned friends or, or neighbours is to actually ring in to the Rural Support Helpline and talk to one of our team. Uh, it really does depend on what the circumstances are and what your relationship is to the person. Um, we would always say that uh, the person has to want to come to us. They have to want to engage in the services that we provide. However, if there are any concerns around mental well-being, for example, or concerns that someone may have suicidal ideation or any of those types of, of um, you know, concerns, uh, we can help the 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 um, 
a concerned family member or a concerned neighbour to work through their own feelings around it, where it has come from, what they're witnessing, what they're seeing, how that's impacting on them. And then we would uh, try and see if there's a way of getting that person referred into us. Another thing that you can do is speak to the person directly and get their permission for us to contact them. So that's all we need to have is their permission and that they are able to pass over their name and their phone number. So we would encourage that person just to, to ring our helpline. Yeah, it's a very interesting question there because it does sort of um, bind in with that uh, question about trust and how people trust you and about how you go about things. So thank you very much for that, uh, Veronica. Norma, um, high praise for you, uh, people just saying thank you so much for sharing your story with them. Um, you did mention about um, Embrace Farm. How hard was that to set that up at the time? Um, because you did need support, you did need to get a voice out there. Did you find that people ran to help you or was it a struggle? Well, I guess the first thing to mention is we had no idea what we were getting into setting up a, a charity and a support network. Um, but when we went about it and started having conversations, there was huge support from the agri industry out there. Um, the agri media were very helpful to us and trying to get the message out. Um, and I found at the time a lot of the agri businesses were just happy to help us and support us without looking for recognition for doing so. Um, I guess what we were doing was, as we started off at a remembrance service, you know, to remember those who had died in farm accidents. So we were just trying to put names to those numbers. So there was there was huge support for that. But in saying that at the same time, in Southern Ireland, we have huge regulations, as I'm sure you have in Northern Ireland, around the setting up of charities and, you know, because some people do abuse that and um, there can be corrupt nature to it. So something we were very concerned about doing that right from day one um, around financial controls, things like that, money that we get, and how we spend it and the transparency around that. Um, there's a lot of... Um, paperwork involved and a lot of regulation involved in keeping on top of that for, for small charities definitely so I guess we didn't know what we were getting into and had a lot to learn mm. and um, Michelle uh, obviously uh, food and drink are big concerns I, I know we do not want to go down the road too much of that dreaded b word uh, everybody's heard a lot about it but um we also know that it, COVID has affected our industry quite a bit um, in Northern Ireland. But I just wanted to know how you think COVID has affected the industry in a positive way. For instance, I was reading recently about how cheese has become a major winner when it comes to COVID lockdown. Can you give us an idea about those winners that we've experienced here? I know that you've given sort of a wee bit of an overview there before. Um, it's actually, I think, in many ways, it's benefited most producers. It's been very um, hard for distributors, particularly distributors in the hospitality. But I think it maybe made some people um, have a go at the, for example, the home delivery services. Um, and the innovation hasn't stopped. I mean, one of the ladies I put up there was uh, Carol Banahan, who's a, who makes fresh stock. Um, now, who would have thought 10 years ago there would be a market for, you know, fresh beef stock, fresh chicken bone stock? Um, so, yes, you're right. The innovation hasn't, the innovation hasn't stopped. And I think that um, in many ways, it's forced people to, as I say, to change direction. It's forced people to collaborate. And like, I, there have been good things come out of it, apart from the, I know it's been very tough on the big plants and I know that they've actually lost staff to COVID which has been horrific but I um the one thing that sticks in my mind is the retailers her here would say to you that they never had any problem with supply and I don't think that you could say that about companies across Britain you know our our, our producers here really stood up to the came up to the bar and delivered all the time during the pandemic do you think, Michelle, that uh, once lockdown is over, that that will remain in place? 
that that's people supporting their local producers, people going to their local farm shops, people who have um, brought out these pop-up shots, that people will continue to support them because there is this thing that we all bind together and need times of crisis. And then after it's all over, people have very short memories. I think there's, I think there's bound to be a little bit of rollback. Um, but I, don't, I think working practices are going to change. I don't think people are going to go back to being in offices five days a week. And therefore, because of that, and I don't think big companies are going to want to pay for city centre offices if they could cut down that space and you know people could work at home a couple of days a week. So I think that actually that societal change will benefit local producers. But I actually think there is a shift towards localism anyhow. Um, and as you know, as I said, I think the pandemic has just um, pushed it along. Balance that out, of course, with the people who've lost their jobs and are going to be looking for, you know, cheap food. Um, but where people, people who have money, I think will support local and will continue uh, to buy from the local farm shop. Um, Veronica, we have had a question in for you. Um, somebody is saying, if I wish to become a volunteer in some way with rural support, how do they go about it? Okay, well, as I mentioned in the presentation, we have around 35 volunteers and they help across the organisation on our support line. They also provide support at events. Uh, they also provide support through our Across the Hedgerow programme. Uh, what I would suggest they do is come, go onto our website, ruralsupport.org.uk, um, and go into the volunteer section. Uh, there is an inquiry form there that they can fill out, or just lift the phone and ring in to our office number, uh, 028-867-60040, and speak to Deborah Gavin, who is our volunteer coordinator, and she can fill them in on how to apply. Um, there is a process. Uh, obviously, uh, not everyone will want to, you know, will fit. So um, there is a process and application that they have to fill out. But we very much welcome any support that people are willing to give. And we do value the time that people give to the organisation to support our farm families. Yeah, very oh. worthwhile. And thank you very much for that question coming in. A uh, question for yourself, Norma, and it's from Nathan Highlands. Um, he's my cousin uh no nepotism it's just because he's he's come in and i know nathan's story um and uh this is why he's asked this question he said uh, can you share some of the coping mechanisms your husband specifically engaged with following his father's passing what did you as a family find most helpful after being left in such an unimaginable position and what advice would you give to those who find themselves in similar sudden death situations um, look, I know when everybody goes through a very traumatic situation, they can react very differently. You know, you could be a number of siblings in the one family and your reactions can mystify your siblings and how you do it. But for us personally, um, the first 12 to 18 months of um, my father and last passing were very, very, very difficult in this house. Um, Brian, I suppose, would probably personify the typical man. Um, and I don't like to stare stereotype, but he was silent and he didn't speak. And I think that was because he didn't, he wanted to be strong and he wanted to be there for me. And he didn't want to burden me with his troubles, not just the loss of his dad, but the financial burden that had come upon the farm because his father had died. There was huge burdens placed upon him financially um, with the rest of the family, things like that. Um, and I guess I was, we were just so newly married and my job was gone as well because I had moved from one area to the next and, and, and not had, had not gotten a job. So he really didn't want to burden me with that. But I think a corner turned when, um, when we decided to do something with Embrace Farm. Um, he came in one dinner time to me and he asked me to Google support for families affected by suicide. And I got a huge shock and I started asking questions and it goes, why do you want me to look up that? And why, why, why? And he's just like, just do it. And I'm like, OK, and I'm freaking out and I'm Googling. And they say, find all these organizations. And I start calling them out to him. And I said, you can ring these people and you can talk to them. And I was trying to sell them. 
And next thing he says to me, he said, now he says, Google support for families following a farm accident. There was nothing. There was nothing. Uh, and when that started the conversations, Brian started telling his story to people and what had happened with his dad and how things were since. You know, 12 months, 18 months, two years down the road, Brian had kind of come back to me as such. So all I can say is talking talking to people it doesn't have to be a professional it can be a good friend a, a good extended family member or you know even through our life beyond program it, you know there will be a peer-to-peer -peer element of it talking to another farmer who has been through this similar journey as you and i've seen it with the other families that have come in touch with us as well when we first meet them they're broken they're absolutely broken you chat to a dad you know who's lost his son I mean, you, you'll see no more broken person than that. But light comes back into them again. It's not that you'll ever get over a tragedy. You never will. You, you'll just learn to live with it. Um, you'll find some ways to try and learn to live with it. And it's by talking. Talking. Yeah. That's Norma, it. thank you very much for that. I'm sure Nathan will find that um, very beneficial. Uh, we, I know that we're getting really tight for time. The questions are coming in thick and fast, so we'll maybe do and see if I can do a, a quick fire round if I can. Michelle, a very interesting question has come in for you. Uh, what would your ideal signature Northern Ireland uh, or food NI meal be? It's really hard to answer that because <laughs> it depends. <laughs> Am I making it myself? <laughs> Beans on toast. <laughs> no, uh, it'd have to be, I mean, if I was making it myself, it would have to be something to do with cumber spuds, uh, maybe a bit of cabbage, parsnip, turnip, some lovely Northern Irish uh, meat of some sort, uh, brownie apple and cider, or else rhubarb crumble, I'm not sure. I well, think that's all good. to make hungry. <laughs> all good choices. Sweet tooth, I'd say, Michelle, there, yeah, maybe. Yep. Yes, I thought that. <laughs> Veronica, quick question to you again. Um, somebody is saying that uh, with you know limited resources in the public sector, particularly whenever we're coming to um, you know the amount of money that was spent on COVID, how confident are you that you can continue to get the expertise and the money to continue with your service? Okay, so within the organisation, uh, in relation to counselling services in particular, we have two qualified counsellors on our staff team. We also are a tra trauma informed care organisation where all of the team undertake training in that specific area. We also have our mentors and staff uh, getting coaching training. Mm -hmm. We're halfway through that, actually moving towards accreditation. Um, we also can work with partner organizations. So we will monitor demand as it comes through. We have a number of mentors who mm -hmm. have counseling and psychotherapy backgrounds working with us already. And so I'm, I'm confident we can meet the demands. And you know, if we have to train people, we will find the funding to train people. Um, but I'm, I'm not concerned. We just need to be there to meet what people need on the ground. And that's our, our mission. Okay, thank you very much, Veronica. And we have come to the end of our evening, everyone. Thank you so very, very much for joining us. And I hope you gained so much from this seminar. I know that I really did with that question and answer session. Um, thank you very much to our speakers this evening. That's Veronica Morris. Norma Rowan and Michelle Sherlow. It was a pleasure and has been a pleasure to hear you. And we really appreciate you giving up your time, your very valuable time to speak to us this evening. It's also a big thank you too to the amazing team behind this seminar who have put so much hard work into it, so much time to bring it all together. That's Heather Stewart, Jennifer Hawkes, Carol Bell, Caroline Doyle, Christine Kennedy, Denise Kelso, Heather Patterson, Marianne Buick, Sarah Morell, and Martin Malone, NFU Mutual for their kind sponsorship. I have, if I have missed anybody out, please direct all your complaints to Heather Stewart. Um, can I also remind you that the charity we are supporting is Life Beyond or the project we're supporting, which delivers bereavement services, as we have said during the course of this for, for, for the farming community in Northern Ireland. The goal of Life Beyond, as you've been hearing about, is to provide a connected range of bereavement support services and activities for the farming community in Northern Ireland with the aim of improving the mental, social and physical well-being of farm families who have been bereaved. Uh, so a, a very, very worthy project. Now, if you want to donate and you wish to donate, details of that will be emailed to you alongside the Watch Again link. So please do have a look at that. And I did say that this was part one. 
uh, you've got two more parts here. It's just like line of duty. And the second part of our Women in Agriculture seminar will broadcast next Wednesday evening. That's April the 21st at half past seven. And the theme is women working in the industry. And the speakers for that evening are Chloe Dunn and Esther Skelly Smith. And the Minister Edwin Putz will be making an appearance on that night. And then on uh, April the 28th, it's Business Skills and Agriculture. And there's some strange wee woman called Nicola Weir who's going to be speaking at that seminar alongside Claire McCallion and Victor Chestnut. He is going to be adding the panache into that evening. So please make sure you register as soon as possible. So for me, Nicola Weir and everyone here at the Ulster Farmers Union Women in Agriculture Conference, please do stay safe and do enjoy the rest of your evening.